All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Food Institute CEO Brian Choi, and welcome to today's webinar, Maximizing Opportunities and Minimizing Threats with ERM. I'd like to thank our sponsor for today's event, headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. Hub International Limited is the leading full-service global insurance broker and financial services firm providing risk management, insurance, employee benefits, retirement, and wealth management products and services. With more than 15,000 employees and offices located across North America, Hub's vast network of specialists bring clarity to a changing world with tailored solutions and unrelenting advocacy, so clients are ready for tomorrow. For more information, visit www.hubinternational.com. I'd also like to take care of a little housekeeping. A recording of this webinar will be shared with all registrants and attendees. Please allow a few days for processing and keep an eye out in your inbox for that email. We'll be hosting a brief Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A tab on the side of your screen. Once again, uh, we have two, three industry experts here ready to answer your questions, so let us know what you are thinking. Now I'd like to introduce today's guest, starting with Todd McCumber, who serves as President of Specialty Practices and is also the President and CEO of the Risk Services Division of Hub International. Hub is, Todd is responsible for the development and leadership of Hub's specialty practices strategy across North America. He's a member of Hub's executive committee and Hub's enterprise leadership group. He's also the chair of Hub's crisis management team. We also have Ken Kessler, who is an executive vice president with Hub International in Los Angeles. He has more than 45 years of insurance brokerage and consulting experience and is nationally recognized for his expertise in remote processing distribution and manufacturing industries. And last but not least, we want to welcome Christy Howard. Christy is part of Hub's International Complex Risk Practice. She delivers tailored enterprise risk management solutions and analytic decision support to clients throughout North America. Christy has 25 years of experience in ERM and risk analytics consulting. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to, to Todd to get today's session started. Thanks, Brian. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today for this extremely important topic. I'm minimizing opportunities and minim maximizing opportunities and minimizing threats with DRM. We're excited about the panel of experts we have here and certainly ready to answer any questions you may have. Quick view of the agenda. First, we'll talk a bit about who Hub International is, and thanks, Brian, for that intro. Christy will talk about risk management today and cover a number of different enterprise risk case studies alongside Ken Kessler. Ken will take some time to give us an update on the insurance market, and then we'll do closing with some Q&A at the end. The one thing I would add to Brian's bio, and <clears throat> Brian, thank you for that, is that I've been in the insurance risk management field for about 27 years. 23 of those years were spent either serving in or consulting to the food industry. So definitely passionate about the industry and passionate about this topic specifically. So first, let's go through just an overview of who Hub International is and what our focus areas are. First off, our vision. Our vision to be, is to be everywhere risk exists, today and tomorrow help and protect what matters most. Our mission is to protect and support the aspirations of individuals, families, and businesses to empower our employees to learn, grow, and make a difference in their communities. With that, can we queue up the video? What will tomorrow look like? Will it be what you expected? Or something you never could have predicted? Will it be frightening or exciting? Is it the reason you can't sleep at night or the reason you get up in the morning? Tomorrow will be all of these things. With Hub, you have a partner today who supports you as you write your tomorrow. And we will protect you when you get there. Because the truth is, tomorrow is a gift. And we want you to be ready for it. So look for the presentation here. There we go. All right, just a few data points on Hub. Uh, Hub came into existence as, as its entity in 1998. With over 500 offices, 2 million clients, and over $30 billion in premium, we rank as a top five broker globally. We're investing a lot in specialization. And that's a big focus of ours. In fact, the majority of our industries that we specialize in make up the majority of our revenue. So one of our big practices is food and agribusiness. If 40,000 uh, clients and $2 billion in premium, this ranks one of our larger practices of the 10 that we have focused industry solutions around. 
Each practice has credentialed experts, risk and claims expertise, proprietary consulting and insurance solutions specific to that industry. Now, today we're going to be talking about ERM, and we wanted you to have a couple of themes in your head as we're starting to go through this presentation. One is the current risk landscape. Complexity and volatility of the current market and the risk landscape calls for a very measured, coordinated, and strategic approach to ERM. I think the last three years especially showed us that. We're going to talk about what ERM is. It's a, a process and a way to systematically address threats to food businesses and uh, from a myriad of sources. Also, we're going to talk through risk financing, how to strategically approach risk, risk financing with the current state and the insurance market in the food industry. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christy and Ken to begin the presentation. Super. Thanks, Todd. Good afternoon, everyone. Possibly good morning for those of you on the West Coast. Let's dive right in and have a chat about the risk landscape today and sort of the world that we're faced with. One sec, I think. I'm... Okay, so just sort of level set our conversation today. I'm going to express how we define ERM at Hub. It's a structured approach to effectively identify manage, and communicate risks across an organization. This requires calling out all of the institutional knowledge from pretty much every functional area in the organization. That collaborative work is sort of the, the secret sauce that makes ERM beneficial. When implemented properly, it can serve as a mechanism to eliminate surprises, get you more in the driver's seat. The documentation that comes out of the ERM processes includes a very robust view and a register warehouse, if you will, of all the risk data that you are maintaining and collecting. One of the most important pieces of this are action items and steps that are realistic for you to improve the overall risk profile of your company. And to be honest, if you don't have the action items and a plan going forward, then ERM doesn't really deliver much value. It's just more of a uh, form filling exercise. Let's look a little bit into the moving parts of ERM. There's sort of two phases that most people begin an ERM initiative with. One is developing a framework for your company to employ the ongoing process of ERM. And the other place is to conduct a comprehensive business-wide risk assessment. So I'm going to start with the risk assessment. And, and this is probably the place that most people start and um, probably the one where we need a little guidance on exactly how this works. So what we suggest doing at first is defining a scope for your risk assessment. This is sort of like the purpose of your ERM initiative. We want to make sure that it puts a ring fence around what we're talking about so that people are focused in the right areas. We're not looking at the meteor strikes or things that happen on a fairly regular basis. We, we are looking specifically at threats to the execution of your strategy that threaten to disrupt your operations like supply chain interruptions and keep the talent um, in your organization that you need to be successful. There are several different processes and approaches, of course, to do begin an ERM project. And I would say that there are as many ways to implement ERM as there are organizations implementing it. So certainly don't get tied uh, to one thing and uh, think that's the only way that you can run it. So there are basically three methods for running a risk assessment. There's risk surveys, interviews, and facilitated workshops. Probably best to use a combination of those. They all have some pros and cons to them. And once you've decided on the right approach for your organization, then you want to conduct that risk assessment and gather as much information as you can. Be mindful to capture things like drivers and your current mitigation strategies that are in place right now. 
the tendency for most people is to define risk in terms of a trigger or maybe even the consequences. But it's really more important to understand the whole picture of it. Like, why is this such a problem for us? And what are our limitations that make this exposure so concerning? Then you'll move into prioritization and measuring of risks. Best way to do this is to establish some rating scales. So that gives you a quasi numeric way of uh, getting that prioritization in place. And then you have a sort of a list of where to focus, and where we're gonna put our, um, our resources on this. Once all this information has been collected and documented in this risk register, you want to start looking into ways to enhance or improve your risk mitigation strategy. So that's where we help organizations quite a bit with understanding what risk controls and processes would be available if there's a risk financing or other finan financial instrument that uh, could be put in place to protect you down the road. Um, once these changes are put in, you want to monitor any risk trends and any things that are going on that, that might need to alert you to, to take some action. And then from there, you can build out your risk management, your enterprise risk management annual work plan. Some people like to go in a 24-month cycle. The rule of thumb on the assessment part, at least, is to not go past two years without a, a full comprehensive risk assessment again. So I think we can all agree that the food industry is in a particularly precarious situation because of all the threats coming from pretty much anywhere and everywhere um, to the organization. So things like business process plans, um, continuity plans, disaster recovery and emergency management, those are crucial preventive measures, especially for things like cyber threats and Ransomware is a big, hairy one that um, it's really causing some serious disruptions. Threats to the supply chain really keep all of us on our toes. And that it, that touches pretty much the entire um, organization. And then, of course, nothing runs without your people and keeping the right people in place. The talent that you need um, is crucial. And we are in a really different world now with respect to workforce. And um, Ken's got some really good information coming up about that. All right, so that's a little bit about ERM in theory, um, but we want to dive into some actual examples. These are real world things that have happened. This is how companies have applied ERM and what the solutions are that they are able to arrive at. Let's take a look first at some cyber risks. So as I mentioned, ransomware is a particularly uh, painful and disruptive kind of cyber attack. Um, in 2021, uh, there was a ransomware attack against JBS um, in order to ensure the integrity of their data and continuance of their operations, they elected to pay the hackers to the tune of $11 million. So it's, uh, it's, Pretty, uh, it's a scary that you might be faced with that kind of shutdown, but man, is it expensive. I think it's um, pretty common knowledge that most um, cyber breaches, data breaches happen because of human error rather than an intentional uh, damaging third party actor. Unfortunately, having people in all these alternative working situations throughout the pandemic that's gotten a little bit more out of hand. And so we, we're we working hard to help our clients get everything back under control and and learn how to work with these, with these changes in the workload. Right, so in this uh, specific case, we were working with a airline catering company. They needed our help with specific risk areas. The one that was the most concerning to their board was cyber threats, rightly so. There had been a lot of activity around them at this point and, and it made the board really nervous. And of course, if the board is nervous, then everyone is nervous. 
So they had started their own ERM program, which is fantastic. An organic ERM program is absolutely fantastic. You have to take this on yourself at some point. So I worked to put myself out of business more or less. But, you know, bravo, they had started something on their own. The program that they had in place, however, was not giving the board the level of comfort that it really wanted and it really needed um, to carry on safely and, and execute their strategic plan. And so we took a, a look at their um, existing program. We found some, some places for improvements um, and a priority risk list was reestablished so that we could see what the really heavy hitters were and take a deeper dive on those. The data breaches and network outage, um, the network outage was actually the, the, the worst situation that they were contemplating. And so they wanted to, you know, shore up their mitigation strategies on that. And we helped make some changes there uh, to better protect the organization. The important change was that we started, that we showed them how to start taking deep dives into each of these areas of risk. So once they had a better understanding of the overall impact of this risk and how the events may come up against them, we brought in our subject matter experts in cybersecurity, and they help the client implement additional security protocols, new security pro protocols, developed a more robust employee training program. And that's what we're seeing as one of the most effective mitigation strategies for cyber threats is to constantly train people, keep it on their minds. Um, and I know that uh, in organizations I've worked with, there's a, a little tricking going on where people are sent emails um, that pretend to be phishing attacks and, you know, people have to respond to them appropriately or they get a, they get a little nasty note. I think that's pretty effective. So supply chain, obviously this is pervasive. Disruptions in this area just grind everything to a halt. Um, the majority of food retailers are experiencing interruptions and that that's real dollar negative impacts on everybody. A lot of different things are contributing to the concern around supply chain that sort of increase and become more and more complicated. Uh, macro, macro issues like the economy, climate change, geopolitical events. You know, this is, these are the things that that are are standing in the way of continuing operations if they are in an area that impacts you. Right. So, in this example, um, this is a U.S. grocery chain. They wanted to understand their operational risks a bit better. So this definitely involves supply chain threats. And again, the board, the board says that they're really concerned about, well, we can't spend all this money and time going into this assessment and more mitigation strategies and, you know, more problems for everyone if this is a problem that we can't solve. I just didn't see any way out of it. So for this organization, they had done some work in ERM, but it was not to the level that they that they needed, the depth, the details that they needed to have um, a positive impact on their risk profile. And this included a lack of the action steps I mentioned. So again, to, to make ERM work and to make it valuable, you've got to have some steps in place that are realistic and practical um, to get you where you need to be. So we worked on, on that aspect of it, the details to help them be better prepared and put them more in the driver's seat of facing those unknown threats in terms of um, operational disruption with supply chain issues. So we worked with the chief risk officer to craft um, a framework that more specifically defined how they want to assess risk, how they want to prioritize them, and how they want to de deal with those. So we helped them define a method for analyzing specific 
supply chain risks and, and a, a few other big buckets as well. Workforce challenges certainly was there. And they found ways that they could make improvements that we could advise them on, including reworking contracts and exploring new strategic partnerships. And then we also brought up some, some advice about possibly putting something in their captive that has a parametric trigger that's related to supply disruption. And, um, and this had to do with one of their key suppliers and um, uh, grain yield. So the, you know, that's uh, that's probably a, a topic for another webinar. But you know, it's just thinking of things more more creatively uh, on these really big risks. So I'm going to um, ask Ken to cover um, some information on the challenges related to workforce in the wor world of food. Uh, he's got some great expertise to share with you. Thanks. Appreciate it, Christy. So uh, workforce challenges in the world of food. There's two areas that I'm just going to touch uh, briefly on the first one and go a little bit more uh, deeply in the second one. 40 to 50 percent of food companies identify retaining talent as their top concern. Clearly a problem. November 2021 uh, plant in Virginia operating at 70 percent capacity due to Worker shortage, clearly, uh, walkouts, wage, hour disputes, shrinking labor pools, and uh, rising benefit costs have even the most successful companies worried about day-to-day. Uh, -day. I work in the LA and surrounding areas pr primarily. Uh, there's a, a, a city called Vernon, which is where a lot of the meat production is located. You could drive down Vernon, uh, one of the main streets, and on the side of buildings, there are signs saying, we're hiring, uh, stay here 90 days and you get a bonus, things of that nature. So clearly that's a, the labor pool is an issue. I'm not gonna go into some of, uh, some of the specifics as far as uh, what we're doing. The, Christy and I might address that later. I wanted to hit more, uh, uh, more of my commentary on the last bullet point. In 2020, violence was the fourth leading cause of worker fatalities, and there was over 37 non-fatal injuries in the workforce, resulting from an intentional injury by another. In the news in LA just a couple of days ago, there was an article that talked about uh, uh, workplace violence, and it said that half of the attackers uh, are motivated by grievances in the workplace. So. Half of the issues that come up are with employees with grievances. It also said that over half of the attackers experience mental health issues. And um, you, for if California, once again in the news, in Northern California, Half Moon Bay, uh, seven people were killed in a mushroom farm by one of the employees that had issues, uh, had uh, grievances and had a past record. So clearly it's something that we're living with day to day. Let's move to the next. So I wanted to uh, share um, a real life. Uh, uh, one of my clients um, went through this, this scenario. So they had a termination, uh, the employee was terminated. And a couple weeks later, the employee came back carrying a bunch of flowers. They walked right through the, uh, the front desk, let them in, come through the office. They went up the elevator into the second floor and that's where the HR person uh, was. That's where the executive team was. And here comes this terminated employee walking through with just the flowers. They end up right in front of the HR manager's office, which is a glass office. She looks up and there's a terminated employee in front. Uh, heartbeat went a little bit fast at that particular moment. The good news is the flowers were real. The flowers were for her. She helped him get another job after he was terminated. So it was a thank you. But it clearly pointed out there's a deficiency in their overall approach uh, at looking at ERM. The next she called me that probably was in 15 minutes after that event um, and said, we need to do something. So. I reached out to the hub's organizational resilience team. 
to design a protocol for prevention, preparedness, and critical incident response. I've tried to say that fast three times. I can only do it once. Um, but that is that is the uh, the benefit of Hub. They were able to get the the team out. Uh, there's multiple locations, so uh, a review of each of the locations and the and what the security is and the protocol for all of those locations and the outcome, which was the you know what we were looking for, was that the client now has a program to handle potentially violent workplace issues. Uh, be prepared to limit the impact of an incident, and most importantly, save lives. It's the preparedness that is really critical uh, when you're looking at the workplace violence. Um, so that's that's my short story. I'm going to flip it back to Christy. Thanks, Ken. Um, you know, these, these situations are awfully frightening, and they're very real. Um, my uh, I'm going to wrap up with one more case study, um, and it's not nearly as <laughs> not nearly as intense as um, a potential active shooter, um, but it does also deal with employees, and that's really your most valuable asset, right? Having the right talent, wonderful people who have a great culture and get along and get things accomplished together. So, you know, it's, I think sometimes employees are taken for granted and this was certainly the situation from the employee perspective um, in this, in this last piece. So this is all about using an ERM assessment to get a better understanding of significant changes in the organization. When there are changes to, operations, locations, expansions, new leadership. Th these are all key times to consider using ERM to get a good picture of the risk profile and how things might change once these changes are implemented. So in this case, the Mid-South food processor was rolling out a full new line in a completely new location, and they wanted to understand at that point how will our risk profile be impacted once we make that significant change? So they asked us to conduct a business risk assessment specifically based on the changes from the, this new location, this new line. So the, it was interesting that the process uncovered um, some risks that would not have been on anyone's individual radar, but because it was a collaborative workshop with a lot of back and forth dynamic dialogue, they were able to uncover some things as a group that maybe nobody would have brought up individually. And the assumption uh, about this, about the impact of this change on employees was that, oh, you know, we've, we've got labor pool challenges in a new location that we're, uh, that we're going to, and we're going to need to you know, really beef up our incentive programs and communicate those and make sure that, you know, we get the right people in and we can keep them there. What turned out to be a bigger issue was how this change was impacting the employees at the original location. And it made perfect sense once we started talking about it. Well, wait, they're hearing that there are a bunch of jobs in this new location you know, there were rumors that they were closing the original location. It just, it really got out of hand. It was in a fairly small community. And, you know, this just started seeping out into um, the community around them. And, and they were concerned that this, you know, significant employer in that town was going to just pack up and leave. So there, there were just a lot of things going on about it that we, that we started uncovering during the risk assessment process. And so, again, any of these things sort of in a silo may not have seemed to be that significant, but pulled together, there's definitely a pattern. There's definitely something going on here. So what we did to, to help this client um, assuage their current <laughs> employee population to make sure that uh, they didn't have a, a mass exodus and that people felt good about working there still. So our human capital specialist came in using our persona tool, which provides re very real data, like live 
data about their uh, workforce statistics indicators of what uh, what concerns are in their employee base and what things they need to address. And with all of that information, then they were able to help the client build um, a program that would really recognize the hometown employees. Addition, new incentive ideas, you know, didn't cost a lot, but it, you know, was very meaningful to the employees. And uh, they had a town hall um, our folks were in attendance at the town hall and, you know, it just it, everybody aired their grievances and um, and and everything turned out pretty well. So uh, that's going to be the last case study for us. But I'm going to ask Ken to come back and give us an overview um, of the insurance market for 2023. Thank you. And uh let me get to, I just want to hit some of the major uh, lines of insurance. Uh, it's the beginning of 2023. All of us are looking at the insurance coming forward. So uh, let me hit a couple of the areas that I just want to give you notice. Be prepared to work within your organization. Property coverage uh, relative to catastrophic loss areas. If you're in the West Coast, you're looking at California, you're looking at fires and you're looking uh, at earthquake. If you're on the middle of the, of the US on the East Coast, you're looking at tornadoes, floods, that type of exposure. If you're in one of those areas that we call catastrophic loss, the price of insurance for property can go up substantially, maybe 50 to 150% more than last year. Important to be in front, talk to your provider, your, your broker, your risk manager, to see what your situation is. Liability coverage um, is still going up. Your loss history and your safety record will be an important part to managing cost. Uh, so that's uh, an area to take a look at. Standard property insurance, any of your buildings, your equipment um, uh, will be, pricing will go up. But a big part of what is the buzzword in insurance carriers right now is insuring to value. Over the last several years, uh, because of supply chain, because of lack of materials and people, the cost to rebuild is substantially higher. So take a look at your valuation of your buildings to see if it's current with today's uh, replacement cost needs um, and be prepared to either explain that it is or have an argument with the insurance company as what the proper number should be. Be prepared. Excess liability. For those of you that have had 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 50 million of excess liability, in the last two years, the price has gone up dramatically. I think in 2023, the pricing may go up a little bit, but certainly a lot more favorable for the higher limits of liability. Auto, auto is a, um, an ongoing issue with insurance carriers. So it's the nine or 10% increase that they're all looking for. If you have uh, done some fleet safety and have some other uh, areas that you've improved upon, you may be able to mitigate that. Cyber, um, Christy talked about cyber. Uh, the insurance buying might be a little bit better this year. If you've done all of, it started with just um, MFA and some basic areas for cyber protection and things have improved. If you've done the work, your cyber renewal most likely will be better than in past years. If you haven't, then I suggest uh, Hub has a great team that can help you improve your cyber outlook and uh, willing to help you do that. The uh, For those that haven't done anything, uh, clearly it's the time to do that. The cyber hackers are not just looking for large companies, they're looking for vulnerable companies. So keep an eye. Uh, product recall, um, that's another area that uh, the good news is right now, the rates have been trending downward. My renewals have been uh, less money than the previous year. And for the first six months of 2023, I think that'll continue to be the case. There's some large cases out there that may come down, 
that may change the trending, but hopefully uh, it'll stay down. And then you have workers' compensation, which that's the good news. I'm leaving on a good note. Um, workers' compensation has been profitable for the carriers across the United States. So pricing has either been flat or it's gone down or some of the carriers that are looking at your property or liability will say, we want the workers' compensation and that will help uh, to decrease any uh, or offset any pricing on your property and liability policies. Thank you, Todd, Christy and Ken for, for a great presentation. Um, one thing I just wanted to, to ask the group here, and maybe maybe Todd, you can you can lead off uh, lead us off here, is that um, a comment was made during the presentation that many company uh, many company leadership they think of risk in terms of like an isolated kind of incident, right? And so normally when when uh, management teams think about risk, they're like, okay, it's after the fact an incident has happened, um, and so you know from from the group's perspective here. Um, if management teams don't have a comprehensive sort of strategy and framework in place, um, break it down for the group here. Like what, what should be the first step? Uh, what's the second step? And then if you can just walk through, through that, I think that will kind of help uh, set the stage for, for the rest of the questions here. Mm -hmm. That sounds like Christy. <laughs> Possibly. Um, I welcome anybody else's comment on this. But, um, you know, this it's good. The first thing is to is for an organization to understand, for the management to understand that there's real complexity to risk. And it comes in from a, a number of places and it affects a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you, one of the keys I think to start with is to identify people in the organization who really know how it works and have some have a view of the big picture as well as sort of what happens on a day to day basis. And a mingling of those perspectives um, is a great, a great tool in the ERM process. So I would suggest they begin by uh, reevaluating their view of risk, uh, choosing some people who can you know, really contribute to how things are, are are working. And then you can kind of connect the dots when you see commonalities uh, among those risks and the perspectives of those folks. Um, and so I can't stress enough, you know, get some action items. Once you have a better handle on what the risks are and how they might occur, um, definitely, definitely work on some action steps that are realistic. I mean, things that can actually be put in place um, to improve the risk profile. And, and I would add too, and, and thanks Christy, is that oftentimes the mistake we see organizations make is that they think of risk, safety, or quality in silos. It really needs to be part of the fabric of how they do business every day. And they may not have the resources to take an ERM approach internally. So talk to your broker, talk to your carrier, see what's out there, talk to hub and uh, see if somebody can help you really identify what the world of risk looks like for your organization and some easy steps you can take or more involved steps you can take to make it a little bit better. Got it. Great. Um, so a question for you, Todd. Um, so Hub is is known as being an, insur an insurance company. Um, does It seems like based on the presentation that Hub also provides advisory services as well, which I think is news to you know many folks in the food industry. Um, does Hub provide advisory services for non-Hub insurance clients? We, we do, and thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Becoming an insurance client of Hub gives you automatic access to these teams and these services. We have, combined between risk and claims, over 320 professionals that are focused on helping our clients succeed. We do provide a lot of these services externally as well. So if you're not an insurance client of Hub, you still can access these services. And I think a good point of contact from this presentation would be Ken, Christy, or even myself, to help you get pointed in the right direction. Got it. Great. Um, I want to touch upon cybersecurity since that's been all over the news for the past couple of years. And I think the, you know, the, the examples brought in, you know, by, you know, JBS, um, you know, just last week, Yum Brands got, got hacked in, in the UK, shutting down three, 300 operate, uh, 300 mm -hmm. operations. I think one of the, mo one of the more interesting facts that I saw in the presentation is that a lot of them are, uh, are based on just how employees, just day-to-day -day employee sort of like kind of best practices. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, what is, what's, you know, for, for companies to really understand how to kind of prevent 
kind of uh, um, cyber risks and what employees can do from like an individual perspective and from a corporate perspective. Can the um, you know can the group talk uh, talk through what what's you know how to assess the risk? What's sort of the best practices in terms of training employees mm -hmm. that they you know limit that vulnerability in their organization for hackers to come in? Um, what's what's the recommendation here um, you know from the group and you know, I'll open it up to whoever wants to take uh, take mm -hmm. that uh, question. I've got a couple of comments, and then you know, please uh, please jump in, guys. Um, I think that employee awareness is probably the most successful tool for um, preventing uh, cyber breaches, data breaches, um, and possibly the network outage as well. Um, there are um, there are specialists who do like penetration testing and and you know some very technical things. Um, that's always that's always a really good um, component if you um, are in a position to to hire one of those specialists. Um, and uh, no no self promotion here, but I think uh, particularly at this time in the market, it's really important to uh, double check your limits on insurance uh, for cyber risk. Um, I, you know, I would say seven or eight times out of 10, um, we find that um, companies may not be as protected as they think they are, or it might be just a little short. So, you know, just take a look at that. Well, and I think you're on mute there. Lines food account hired a new CIO, and they were interested in what kind of training uh, um, what subject matter, et cetera. Uh, Hub, as I've mentioned before, has a resilience team. Part of that resilience team is somebody that specializes in cyber. So we connected the two individuals and they're going to map out a strategy based on the needs of the company and what we have to offer. The good news is uh, in this particular situation, it's a client of ours with Hub. So uh, all of the work, all of that um, uh, planning and execution, that's, that is a benefit from being a hub client. That can also be done on a, as Todd had said before, on a health service uh, scenario, but that's the best way to do it. Mirror some of that conversation with the expert to uh, really beef up your internal organization. Yeah. And I just want to emphasize to the group here and whoever's going to be watching the recording, definitely take a look at cybersecurity as a significant risk. Um, many of the leading food and beverage companies have been hacked. Um, if, if someone can hack JBS, um, you know, there are a lot of food companies out there that, that can be hacked and it is extremely disruptive. A lot of, um, you know, the food companies that, that I'm in contact with, um, some of them have been hacked. And it, it shut down operations in, in one case, maybe two, three, th two, three week, weeks. Um, and so uh, I think a lot of folks have the question, you know, cyber insurance premiums have gone up significantly, you know, uh, since the, you know, since, you know, from two years ago to today. Uh, can you had in your market outlook that it's, it's looking more positive? Uh, can you share a little bit more details on on you know where premiums are and and um, you know how can how can folks here uh, learn more about um, getting the right type of cyber security insurance in place? So the premiums. So first of all, the you know um, pr the premiums are going to depend on the size of the organization um, and what their needs are. So it's a that's a moving target that I can't really put pin a a, a, a number on. But I can tell you that I just had a renewal that was a January 1st renewal um, and the the uh, client bought $10 million of cyber coverage. Last year, it took uh, four companies to provide that uh, coverage that they needed. This year, it only took two and the pricing went down a little bit from last year. That's not always the case, but during the course of the year, we had ongoing improvement to the protection for that particular client. So it's really, you need to do, um, you need to do an evaluation first and see what protection you have in place. It's continuing to move uh, tougher and tougher controls because of just what you said, Brian, um, the clients are being hacked on a regular basis. 
So the carriers, when they recognize that you've done more for the prevention, they become more willing to give you limits and your pricing. So that, that's really the continuum that uh, needs to happen. It's constant assessing of your protection. Got it. And I will remind everyone here that there will be a podcast specifically on cybersecurity that will be published probably in the next week or so. So, uh, you know, please be on the lookout for uh, the podcast that will be will be coming out. Um, one question um, um, that I have is in terms of the workplace violence. Now, this is a new, you know, this is a newer phenomenon, uh, a very tragic one. Um, but um, I think a lot of folks here are wondering what is the cost of uh, workplace violence audit and impl implementation? What's involved? Um, can you share a little bit about that, Ken? Yeah. So um, in this particular situation, um, when the client asked me, I went to our team. They came out and they laid it out. The it, it entails a interview with the client, and then they talk about uh, the initial client. Then there's a the organiza organizational piece for the they they use the basis of this with their safety committee. They were all on it, and then the locational managers. Then the the next step is to visit all the different locations, come up with their findings, meet back with the insured and their team and uh, lay out what the protocol is going to be. It entailed bringing people from, uh, Hub has people across the US, if you will. So somebody from Wisconsin flew out, met our safety uh, 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 manager from the west side. Uh, they went, went through the whole process. And in that particular situation, uh, the cost would be around $15,000 uh, for this particular client. No cost to the client because they are a, a hub a client. So it'll be, it's probably a three week process uh, to get it from soup to nuts. Um, but that's a general flavor of what you're looking at. And every, every situation is, um, depends on what the, the size and the need is, but that just gives you a parameter of something of that nature. Yeah, and Brian, to give you a sense of the expertise that we bring to bear, you know, you got a sense of uh, Christie's bio and obviously Ken's. Uh, specific to security, uh, the individual that was doing that assessment is, was in charge of uh, enterprise workplace violence prevention for a global retailer. So we're bringing that type of expertise and experience to an individual opportunity and client that has a very specific need that we can solve. Got it. No, that's great. Um, if there are folks here that want to learn more about what sort of ERM frameworks are, uh, you know, available, what, where, where they, where should they go? Um, hmm. And um, and maybe Christy, that's this is a question for you, but what, where are, where should they go? Should they, you know, um, in terms of hub resources to learn more mm -hmm. about the right types mm -hmm. of frameworks to implement for food and beverage companies? Right, absolutely. Um, hubinternational.com is uh, is the place to go for all of this and and just um, you know use that use those keywords um, there are some there are other resources um, we don't the way we approach ERM is a completely tailored approach by company and so we don't um, we don't have like a cookie cutter one but you can learn quite a bit about other standard frameworks through COSO they have a, a very specific framework. Um, it's a little bit more focused on the compliance side where ERM grew out of um, the internal audit function. So it's a little focused on that. Um, I think it, it sort of focuses on the wrong details, but, um, and then the ISO 31,000. So from the International Standards Organization, um, that's, an, that's an interesting one. And then um, if folks are members of RIMS, the um, risk management society. They have some interesting, some interesting pieces there. And uh, one final one, um, I was on the advisory board for the ERM initiative at NC State. They have a really huge library. A um, lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to be learned there, but please come to Hub first though and see what we've got going on. <laughs> Great, great. No, this is this is tremendous. So, um, I'll give an opportunity for each of the presenters here. Maybe starting with Todd, 
um, just one close, you know, a closing statement that you want to um, share with the food and beverage community. And then we'll, mm -hmm. we'll go to Christy and, and Ken, and then we'll cl close up today's webinar. So Ty, why don't you uh, share some, some closing thoughts here? Well, well, thank you, Brian. And thanks mm -hmm. for this opportunity to have Hub present on this webinar. You know, ERM can be a daunting subject for many organizations. I think a lot of the questions are where to start. And it, it doesn't have to be that daunting. It could be a very simple, systematic and strategic approach to looking at risk in the organization. You can get as big or as small as you want, and it can take many different directions in terms of how it gets out. So laid out some frameworks and good examples in terms of how we've done it and what we've seen uh, with our client base. But certainly there's a number of different avenues we can take. And it doesn't have to be a, an overly sized project. So, Christy? Yeah, uh, thanks, Todd. Um, if I could leave you with the thought that um, an ERM approach is particularly effective with organizations and companies that have a lot of complexity and, and, you know, a lot of moving parts. And, you know, just from, you know, seed to store, you know, kind of uh, the food process, for example, is um, there are just, there's so many different things happening there, no matter which, which segment you're, you're part of. And, um, you know, I mean, also to just say, I mean, food, in itself is very important in terms of workers and what it supplies to the U.S. economy and to individuals. There's just a lot to consider. And this is a really, um, you know, as Todd was saying, it can be a very straightforward, simple process, but you really have to look at things through the lens of the entire operation to fully understand where things are coming from, what the current situation is, for, for you specifically and, um, you know, how, how to, how to do more. It's, you learn so much. You have such a deep understanding about how your company operates, the threats to it, the things you're doing well, um, and how you can do things even better. Great. Ken. Um, I see a lot of different size companies and, um, a common thread is who is going to be responsible for, implementing uh, uh, safety ERM and take really take that company's first step to make something happen. And I think that uh, you've heard a lot of good things that we've talked about, but it's important within your company, somebody make somebody accountable, get that first step going and the rest will come into play. So thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate the time. Great, great, um, great closing thoughts. Um, you heard it here, Hub International Insurance and provides advisory services as well. Cybersecurity risks, supply chain risks, uh, worker risks, um, definitely contact uh, Hub. Uh, Todd, Christy, Ken, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, and again, for the folks that uh, uh, are listening here, a recording will be provided alongside with the, with the deck. Um, alongside with the the contact information of everyone here. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for Hub International for sponsoring this uh, this great webinar. And uh, be on the lookout for the Cybersecurity Podcast that will be, uh, be published in the next couple of weeks. Um, have a wonderful day, everyone. And, uh, and have a, yeah, have a great day. Thank you very thank much. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.